Hey everyone, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. Today I have another Top Projects interview for you. I have with me Russ Wachter. He is Design Project Manager for Corolo. Jean Jensen, she is CIP Project Supervisor for the Town of Gilbert, Arizona. We also have Joe Schrader, Project Manager for the City of Mesa. Rob McCandless, Lead Solids Process Facilities for Brown and Caldwell. And we also have Arif Rahman, Deputy, en Deputy Engineer of Water Resources for the City of Mesa. We're going to be talking specifically about the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant Phase 3 expansion in Arizona. <laughs> being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time and congratulations on a top project. So I want to start first with uh, the size and scale of this this project. Uh, Joe, would you mind taking that one and starting us off giving us an idea of what, what what is the size of this project? What was the scale here? And could you mention a little bit about the community that it serves as well as we, we'll get a little more from Gene and Arif a little bit later on that too. Uh, the reclamation plant is a uh, started out as a 16 million gallon a day treatment plant reclaiming water from three communities: in Mesa, the town of Boulder, and Tonquin Creek. It occupies a 46 acre site and is an end of the line plant. So it uh, whatever comes its way has to be treated. There was no way that uh, there could be any plant shut down or any bypass for the for the plant. It occupies a 46-acre site. I said that already. It was a $170 million project. Uh, what we did on this one, um, it was ex it being expanded to uh, 30 million gallons a day to meet the needs of those three communities that I just mentioned to you. Uh, we selected the uh, construction manager at risk process for uh, procuring this construction. Uh, the reason we did that was because we needed the collaboration of a contractor early on to make sure that all of the construction coordinated with the ongoing activities of the plant. We could not stop anything um, uh, except for very short periods of time. And that re involved uh, entry of planning, which I think you'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, touching a little bit more on the communities that serve, I'll, I'll throw it to you first, Gene. Could you talk a little bit about uh, about the town of Gilbert and um, how big that community is? And then we'll ha get some info from uh, from Arif on the city of Mesa as well. Sure. So we're lucky to be here in the town of Gilbert where we just recently um, have completed this project with our partners, the city of Mesa and the town of Queen Creek. Between the three communities, we have 850,000 or so residents. So this facility is pretty substantial uh, in terms of serving it. So it's a unique, um, a unique site. It's located in the town of Gilbert, operated by the city of Mesa, led up by the city of Mesa, but it's supporting our community's growth and our continued investment in reclaimed water resources. So one of the biggest things for us is that every drop of water that we have is absolutely precious. And so it's important that that water be handled appropriately so that we can then turn around and give it new life by serving our communities in their green spaces, as well as storing it for future needs against drought, shortage, and other challenges. Yeah, Arif? actually, I, 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 before we move on to Arif, I, I did visit the town of Gilbert, uh, I think in 2018, and got to see some of your WaterWise program stuff. It was really, really cool. So you guys do a great, a great work with that. So just to see you guys also doing such big things as well is very awesome. But but yes, Arif, yeah, tell us a little bit about the city of Mesa. Uh, certainly, uh, this is one of the most successful project um, uh, in my career, I would say, and it's, it's a very important project for the city of Mesa. It's one of the three major wastewater treatment plant that we have in the city, and it serves our uh, south uh, Southeast Mesa, where all the growth is occurring. So by adding that additional um, 14 MGD uh, on top of the 16 MGD that was already there. Uh, this this plant is actually a, a major uh, catalyst for for the growth, serving the growth in the in, in southeast southeast Mesa, and also um, this is a state of the art plant, and uh, we're lucky to have uh, an uh, an impeccable team between city of Mesa, Gilbert, and town of Queen Creek uh, as the owners, and then Crollo and uh, Brown Caldwell as our consultants and McCarthy, and we all worked together. Uh, it, it, uh, it had a very uh, tight timeline that we had to make to actually expand the plant 
and we had to choreograph it perfectly. So it was uh, uh, it was as as good as a project can be uh, from a project delivery standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, coordination, very, very important on this one. Like one of the things that really stood out to us for this nomination was that you were maintaining operations while this was going on. And it sounded like there was a lot of care taken in ensuring that the capacity of what you guys were doing wasn't negatively impacted too much. But uh, Russ, could you talk a little bit about that? Like what did you guys do to ensure that operations could stay running as this plant was being built? Absolutely. You know, any work construction project on a treatment plant, you've got to maintain a lot of care in terms of not interrupting the day-to-day the -day operations of that facility uh, because they need to maintain compliance day in and day out. And as Joe mentioned, this is an end of the line plant. We didn't have the option of diverting flow or bypassing flow. We had to deal with everything that was coming into the plant, um, dry weather flows, wet weather flows, increases or changes in loadings. And to be able to do that with the uh, requirements of this project, and as as Arif mentioned, the you know expansion to to uh, you know provide for the growth that's happening in the three communities was one of the major drivers, but there was also some elements of of asset management and renewal that was also a big part of this project. You know, the last major expansion happened 15 plus years ago. Um, some of the equipment. And, and, and elements needed to be looked at for renewal or replacement. And one of the key um, critical functions of this project was also doing some significant work, rehabbing and replacing a lot of the um, programmable, programmable logic controllers, the PLCs, as well as a number of the VFDs operating equipment. So in many ways, this was sort of open heart surgery and brain surgery occurring at the same time, all while maintaining the operations and, and compliance of, of the project. So the selection of, of construction manager at risk, the CMAR project delivery was a, was a great strategy to, 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 to accomplish this by bringing in the, the contractor as your partner early on throughout the whole pre-construction and design phase and in this case, they actually brought on an electrical and an INC subcontractor through a design assist approach to help facilitate and the planning that goes into not only the expansion elements, but the asset renewals and the continuous operations. So a significant amount of effort by all of the parties, including the plant staff who were integrally involved and crucial to the success of this planning to, you know, before we started, you know, any shovel in the ground or, or any, um, you know, wrenches turning bolts, you know, we had a plan that was put into place early on, and then we continued to, to develop and, and further detail those plans throughout construction, a lot of coordination with plant staff between the contractor, the design team, the owners, everybody involved, planning it to the nth degree to make sure that every little um, connection, every, you know, minor shutdown of a process or sequencing of steps would, would fall into place to, with the goal of not interrupting the, the overall day-to-day -day operations of the facility. Yeah. And Rob, maybe you want to talk a little bit more on the solids as well as the, the programming associated. Sure. Um, yeah, just a Another element uh, with uh, particularly with things like the PLC and the VFD replaces, particularly the plant programming. Uh, a lot of this was completed in 2020 at a time when when most of our workforce could not meet in person and we were restricted with the number of people and the amount of time that they could spend on site in the construction trailers. So much of that work was actually done virtually. The programming and the validation of the programming of PLCs was done virtually, uh, which was was pretty remarkable. The other uh, the other really uh, uh, interesting element uh, was maybe not as much that we call the Mopo, but the startup of the new digesters. Uh, we added two new egg shaped digesters to this project, and um, to transfer over the contents of the existing digesters, maintaining performance, not upsetting the process. Uh, was was an incredibly intricate planning process, and 
Uh, we, we spent a lot of hours coordinating with the contractor and plant staff and, and doing detailed, you know, step-by-step -step investigations of exactly how it would go and when things could be done and rates of flow and uh, managing gas pressures. And uh, that, that took uh, many months to com complete that process. I mean, they're, they're similar on the liquids train. I mean, the, the existing plan had two aeration basins. We constructed two additional ones. And so we had to have the new facilities up and running before we could transfer contents very similarly, made some rehabilitation of the existing structures. And then we're kind of transferring and starting up different basins at different times. So both on the liquids train and the solids train, a lot of different sequencing that was involved for the, for the new and the rehabilitation work that, again, just required a lot of planning and effort by all of the stakeholders. And, you know, we were able to complete this project without any unplanned shutdowns or disruptions and maintain compliance through the, you know, three plus years of construction. Bear in mind that those activities that were just described not only involved the physical pipe mechanical connections, but it also involved rerouting power and rerouting the communications and controls. So the lots of wiring and lots of other activities took place at the same time you were turning wrenches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just such an incredible amount of coordination. It's one of the things that I think really stood out about this specific project was just, you know, at the scale that you guys are talking and with all the pieces that are aligned here, the coordination required to make the success a success had to be of the highest possible level. <laughs> like, it, um, and, and on that note, I wanted to ask about, like, you guys had these these meetings, you call them MOPO meetings. Um, why, like, what made those so critical to the success of this project? I mean, you mentioned, like, you know, pandemic, you're not able to meet in person and all that type of thing. But yeah, talk up a little bit about these MOPO meetings and how they made this project so successful. I'll start with, and then Joe Reef and others can, can certainly weigh in, but the term MOPO stands for maintenance of plan operations. So it's specifically geared around how to plan around all the various activities, the sequencing, the tie-ins without having that, that interruption of operation. And so it starts very early during design with all of the stakeholders, again, the contractor and the subcontractors the plant O&M staff, the design consultants, all of the stakeholders to, to look at those in, in very distinct detail, um, you know, pages and pages of, of, of stepwise planning to, before, we, before we actually do that and talking through and making sure that everybody understands the limitations, contingency plans, if something does go wrong, what will need to be happen to be able to, you know, divert within the plant or, or make you know, self-corrections as required. Uh, but it is just a, a commitment and, and diligence to, to pre-planning every one of those activities um, in, in great detail to make sure that there's no surprises when, when we go live and, and there's a lot at risk, you know, at that point in terms of maintaining that, that overall operational compliance. Joe, do you want to add some more to, to some of your activities on that? When we um, met on a weekly basis, looking at the upcoming operations that the contractor wanted to perform, we engaged plant staff to be able to identify what was going to be impacted on their side. And it wasn't just the staff. As I mentioned before, we had to talk to the people who were providing the power and providing the controls to go through and detail out step by step what needed to take place, the sequencing of turning on power, turning off power, uh, turning valves, and, and moving through the complete operation all the way down to a successful completion without interrupting uh, the receiving and uh, processing of uh, incoming sewage. Well, yeah, I mean, now that the, this project completed, I believe, in November of last year, November of 2020, could you talk a little bit about how things have performed since that completion date? Joe, I, I think you wanted to touch on a few things there. Well, what we recognize when we were coming up to the project is that uh, the plant was operating right at capacity. We saw that, uh, we saw that the uh, uh, aeration basins were, were challenged uh, with the incoming flows, and this plant delivered the uh, 
the new aeration basins just in time to get us processing uh, uh, what was coming at us. Um, we, uh, we were able to switch over to the new system, which actually, actually may have occupied the same space, but it was more efficient because we converted to fine bubble diffusers versus coarse bubble. And we converted the process from um, MLK to, um, to, um, to uh, four-stage Bardenfo. So there was a more efficiency uh, in that. And the plant was very impressed with the ability of, of, of the new aeration basins to successfully treat and denitrify uh, the, the effluent that was coming at us. So uh, in, in that sense, they're very happy that we were able to get this delivered and delivered in time. Yeah, I'm certain. <laughs> I'm certain that's the case. You know, anytime you deliver on time, it's a good day. <laughs> Uh, before we close out, is there any other shout outs that you'd like to, ha like, like to have? I, like, there's only five of you on this call, but I imagine there's so many other people who obviously took part in helping with this project. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, with, with you, Russ, and then we can kind of just go around the circle of, of everybody. But yeah, let's start with you, Russ. Any shout outs that you want to have for, uh, for thanking for the project? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you know, the, the construction team that was led by McCarthy Building Company, I mean, they obviously instrumental throughout this whole process during pre-construction as well as construction and the numerous subcontractors that, that were engaged as well. Um, I think we all had a whole team behind this. Any project like this takes a village um, and you know we couldn't do it without the participation and the dedication of everybody, every one of the three owners, um, you know, the Corolla team, Brown and Caldwell team and the contractors led by McCarthy was was absolutely crucial to, to all these successes. Yeah. How about you, Gene? Uh, any, anyone on your team that you'd like to, to shout out? Well, I think the, the folks that aren't on the call that are probably the most significant have to be our operations groups on both <laughs> sides. So that's gonna be Mike Davis, that's going to be some of our field collection staff working for the town. Um, you know, we did a lot of things. I think we all did a lot of things to try and make the conditions at the plant as tightly held as we could so that those challenges as Rob and Russ and others spoke on with regards to continuing to treat that flow were achieved. So managing our lift stations, managing our collection systems, as well as having to be in pretty constant communication. So, I mean, if nothing else, a really solid appreciation for Joe and his leadership as the primary project manager on this. And he's here, so I get to, um, in my viewpoint, he's down in the lower, the lower left-hand corner, but, you know, big, big appreciation because projects like this live and die by communication. And so that ability to communicate up through executive leadership all the way down to line folks that were making sure that everything was working the way it needed to. Couldn't have done it without them. Well, yeah, well you're, not, you're Thanks, up next, Gene. Joe. <laughs> you're up next. You get to give all the shout outs now. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Gene. Uh, but the, I, I do want to underscore something that Gene said. Um, the operations staff, all the way around, they they knew the plant, they knew the system outside of the plant for Gene's people on the on the uh, influent and, and uh, effluent. They were proactive in finding solutions. When they heard something was coming up, they were not afraid to step up and say, hey, "Look, this is what you got to remember. This is what we got to do." And, and providing solutions for us to be able to accomplish the construction. Um, construction. Uh, they're professional, they were skilled and adaptive. You, you really ought to think about that when you look at your staff. Yeah. Rob, how about you? Any shout outs from Brown and Caldwell over there? Yeah, uh, you know, in particular, I, I do want to shout out the, the team that uh, uh, had the, the programming effort, uh, programming the PLCs and entire plant system. Um, that was an outstanding effort and just executed so well. Uh, really, really, uh, did, they did a fantastic job on that. Great. And then Arif, you're, la you're last. What, any shout outs for you for the, for the city of Mesa? I think the team pretty much covered everybody, but uh, <laughs> I, I want to echo the same thing that uh, the whole team, was excellent and obviously Joe's uh, leadership, but also operation actually was the, um, they made a difference because uh, they had to be in each and every of these meetings, all these tons of MOPO meetings and there had to be a lot of planning. And I know that as we were approaching the capacity, we had to sit down with Corolla and Brown Caldwell and come up with some operational um, 
I guess some operational adjustments and, uh, and, and that was integrated into the MOPO. So uh, it was very intri intricately planned uh, throughout this three and a half years journey during construction. Um, it, was, it was an impeccable uh, planning and a perfect choreograph that, that made it very possible. So overall an excellent project. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all for, for being here today and congratulations once again for everyone who is watching. We will have written articles on all the top projects in our December issue of Water and Waste Digest and check back every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We're sharing a new video interview with a top project winner. So you saw this one today. Definitely check out the other ones either last week or the weeks leading up to the rest of the year. So thank you all. And for everyone who's on the call, congratulations once again. You guys are top project winners for 2021. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.